So um, is it all our panelists, how are you all doing? Are we good to get started? Yes, Let's yes. get started. <laughs> okay, great. And I'm still, I'm still admitting folks as they are joining, which is great. But I want to welcome everyone again, uh, people who didn't uh, hear me the first time because of the echoes. Thank you for coming in today. Uh, thank you for putting up with the technical issues, but we are here. We want to get this conversation going. Uh, what I was saying before is that uh, so the HEAL project will tell you more about who we are. I am a Red V from the HEAL projects uh, and from Prestasia. Uh, we have Megan and Jeremy joining Ignacio and I today. And we started having conversations as two organizations that work around uh, preventing childhood sexual abuse and really um, being almost outliers in the field of not just childhood sexual uh, abuse prevention, but sexual violence prevention, because the perspective we take often is from uh, let's, you know, uh, have a, we will describe it as a, as a liberating approach to uh, sexual violence as opposed to a limiting approach. All right. Sorry, I'm just admitting folks as they're coming in. <laughs> Uh, okay, great. So let's let's get going. First of all, intros. Uh, like I said, I'm from he the Heal Project. Uh, I'll pass it to Ignacio, the founder and executive director. And Ignacio, can you tell us a little bit about the Heal Project yourself? Uh, what brought you to this conversation, and uh, what are folks can expect to hear from us today? Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. I'm Ignacio Rivera. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am um, the executive director of the Heal Project. And, um, you know, I'm here because Red V and I <laughs> have been talking about this for a long time. I've been thinking about all of this for many, like decades. And um, we got the privilege of meeting Jeremy and Megan from Prostasia. And we have a lot of similar ideas and, and approaches to ending, uh, you know, child sexual abuse and prevention. So I'm, I'm here because I am in the game for uh, culturally shifting people's ideas about um, sex and sexuality, um, because uh, that is the key to ending and preventing, preventing CSA. And, and uh, something as simple as a fantasy is uh, uh, the kind of the things we grapple with and then um, people are ashamed and have a lot of secrecy. And that's the thing that we want to kind of battle. And so at the Hill Project, we want to pre uh, prevent and end child sexual abuse through healing the wounds of sexual oppression. And we use sexual liberation as the vehicle for that. Thank you, Ignacio. Yes, Jeremy, go ahead. Hi, Jeremy Malcolm. I'm the executive director of Prostasia Foundation. And we're really excited to be here partnering with uh, this wonderful organization, the Heal Project. And um, as Rebi and Ignacio were saying, uh, we do have a similar approach to this problem, and it's a very uh, distinct approach to many other organizations that work on the issue of child sexual abuse. Uh, for a lot of organizations that work on this issue, um, they th their focus or their frame for viewing this issue is, in, is morality and enforcing morality. And ch child sexual abuse is, seeing, is seen as an aberration from uh, sort of traditional heteronormative uh, uh, sexual morality. And we disagree with that. We think that uh, child sexual abuse is a crime. It's a consent violation. It's, it's harm perpetrated by individuals against other individuals. But it's not at its core about sexual morality. Um, at its core, it's about, it's about violence. Um, and it's about, um, uh, it, it's a preventable problem. And you can work on that without uh, turning it into a, a war against sex or a kind of immoral sort of purgatory of, of people who are outside of the sexual mainstream. And so that's why I feel like looking at child sexual abuse prevention through a sexual liberation lens is, um, uh, is, is the way forward if we want to both combat that problem, but if we also want to honour and uplift the experiences of people who are sexually marginalised, people uh, who may be queer, people who may be survivors themselves, people who may be into sort of fantasies um, that are outside of the mainstream or that are regarded as taboo. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today on this live stream. How can we sort of re-center uh, child sexual abuse prevention um, as, as harm prevention and harm reduction rather than as being a war against people who are considered as sexually immoral? 
Thank you, Megan. Hi, so I'm Megan Ingerman. I am a program director for Prestasia Foundation. And everybody else had really good answers uh, to these questions. And so I think for me, instead of uh, keeping on that, I would like to talk more about like my personal, why I came to this. Uh, and the more I think about it, the more I do this work, the more I realize that I'm just really angry at the lack of education I got. And so a lot of what I do now, a lot of what makes this personal for me is not wanting kids to have to grow up without that information and then be adults who have to find it somewhere, but there aren't that many outlets for it. Because I was definitely a person who was like, um, I just didn't know who I was until I was an adult. And I think that journey could have been easier with a lot more information. And so for me, a lot of the fight to end child sexual abuse, a lot of prevention really stems from learning more about who we are, learning more about sexuality, and um, just being able to give people the support they need if they need it. Thank you, Megan. Yeah, and uh, so that's the, that's why we're having these conversations. But I think for me, uh, Jeremy, I was like reading a lot of your blogs, you know, that you were writing about QAnon, some of the stuff that's been coming out, the recent uh, laws with the FOSTA, I think there's the Air Aid Act. There's a lot of things that are ongoing around sexual censorship. And uh, that's from the legal perspective, but also a lot of it is kind of trickling down into the conversations around prevention of sexual violence. I think for me, like uh, the example that comes to mind for me, I'm someone who, you know, is personally into a lot of um, uh, taboo fantasies, right? And also uh, has been in a kink community and has uh, had conversations with other folks. I see a lot of times the this like fear of uh, folks, especially people who have taboo fantasies as like what, not just being the passive or the receiving end of it, but being doing that. So like, you know, I'm into rape fantasies as the recipient. And um, I would hear things from people who were into rape fantasies, partners of mine who were you know, interested in providing that. And this fear that comes up for folks around what's going on in their own heads, that I think a lot of it is perpetuated by these narratives we have around sexual violence. And that you know, if you think of something, we are just almost as bad as the person who's done it. And, and, and that's very scary. And I think that's where we get to these laws that are being passed and these narratives that are like, you know, anybody who has an attraction to anything that is, would be completely, you know, not okay doing that in real life, we demonize them as if they've already done the thing, right? So uh, with that conversation, I think today we specifically wanted to talk with uh, people who are sexual liberators, kinky folks, anyone who has some experience with the world of fantasy and sexual liberation and wants to bring that into the conversation around sexual violence prevention, right? It's, it's a personal thing and a political thing. But first of all, I wanna hear from you all as to who is here today and who's not here today? Uh, what are the voices that uh, we are going to be amplifying in the work that we do? And what are the voices that we, we should be working on bringing in more into this conversation? I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, it was uh, something that I was thinking about a lot of concern that came up for me in that in this work uh, doing, uh, you know, using sexual liberation as like the, the vehicle for this prevention and ending, um, of CSA is, um, um, I lost my train of thought. Can you say that again, uh, Redley? Sure, it's about who is here today oh, and it. who are the That's people fine. not. I got it, I got it. I, I lost it for a second. I was like, what am I talking about? Okay, um, and so I was thinking about um, when we do this work, we get a lot of people that support us, a lot of people that support us, you know, thumbs up and sharing things and, um, and the people that we're trying to connect with are, of course, advocates and people who are serving the people that we want um, to help, but also we want to get to the actual people, right? So what we're seeing is that because possibly sexual liberators, people that have been thinking about um, their, um, their navigation of sex and sexuality within this society might get a better understanding of uh, what we're talking about when we say child sexual abuse is an issue for everyone. That child sexual abuse is not just a childhood issue and not a, and, and, and shouldn't be in a silo, right? And so understanding that means that a lot of the times when we do things like this, there are not a lot of people of color. There are not a lot of uh, 
trans people or trans women, the people that we want to be talking to, or parents uh, of color, or parents who are poor, or parents who have children who are disabled, right? We want to get to those people as well. And so this message that there's, we're trying to fill in this gap, right? Um, we're using words like sexual liberation that actually might not be something that is um, catches on to someone, right? And so we have to use harm reduction approaches and use a lot of different um, techniques to try to get to those people. But right here, um, people learning about our work, most people are the ones who have, have been grappling with this and understanding these things. So we want to do more of the education and deep dive so that this, the group of people who are getting this, the people who are the, you know, being sexually liberated are not just uh, white folks with information, but it's also those really pushed to the margins. And so this information doesn't stop here with you all. It's, it's um, to, to continue and to go further. Can I uh, add to that? Uh, I think one of the reasons why certain um, groups and particularly marginalized people feel excluded is because often they are treated as the part of the problem rather than part of the solution to child sexual abuse. And as we know, um, uh, community, you know, trans people, communities of color are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Um, and by focusing on um, the, the political expediency of, of taking a, a morality-based approach rather than a public health approach, um, uh, really overemphasizes criminal justice solutions to this problem. And so, um, uh, and it also morally stigmatizes, as I said, groups like LGBT, LGBTQ people, sex workers are morally stigmatized. So it leads to an overinvestment um, in punishment and an underinvestment in prevention. Um, and um, talking about uh, sexual liberation, you know, talking about this problem through a sexual liberation lens is uh, challenging uh, when uh, people who express their sexuality um, uh, uh, find themselves, you know, criminalized or harmed for doing so. Um, and I don't think that we can, um, I think we have to bring attention to the collateral harms um, that are caused to, um, to, uh, marginalized groups by by treating this problem as uh, you know um, as detached somehow from the expression of sexuality um, and you know treating it as uh, um, anything that, that veers away from from the mainstream from you know as I said you know white heteronormative expressions of sexuality is automatically suspect and is automatically uh, lumped in with with child sexual abuse, we, we've got to break away from that and um, and say no. You know, you can be kinky and be um, a, a, in favor of protecting children. You can um, have to be fantasies and still care about protecting children. You can um, explore um, through art, through role play, through um, fiction, through um, all of these different ways that our, our minds sort of explore our, our sexual sides. You can do all of those things and still be for the protection of children and uh, still, um, you know, center consent in everything that you do so that, that you, can, you can be as kinky as, as you like and, and still be 100% centered on consent and, and, and not be the kind of risk to children that our mainstream society expects that you are. I mean, I often say like, uh, oh, I don't bring my whips and chains to work when I work with kids. Like I have separate lives. I can compartmentalize these things. I can have the fantasy over here and it doesn't have anything to do with work. So. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. So really, let's really get to that uh, conversation around fantasies. And Megan, actually, let's start with you around this conversation of like, are there, first of all, like, what are fantasies? Like, let's explore that a little bit. And are there some fantasies that are wrong? Is there a line between fantasies that are good and some fantasies that are bad? 
right? It's like, because I think this conversation gets brought up again and again. And a lot of times the self-policing happens, other policing happens. Uh, and it just, it's, I find it to be a really confusing thing. So we want to really start with opening some of that conversation up. Yeah, um, I mean, so for me, it's hard to define something like fantasy in some ways. For me, fantasy happens in your head, and then everything else is, and so fantasy happens in your head, and what happens in your head is only partially under your control anyway. So a fantasy comes to your mind, and it's maybe not socially acceptable, but it's come to your mind, and that's not your fault, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. The only bad thing that happens is if you move forward without consent. So for me, there's no such thing as a bad fantasy. It's possible to definitely have thoughts that are um, not as comfortable for you, uh, intrusive thoughts, that kind of thing. But as far as fantasy goes, I mean, it's your imagination working with you. Uh, I think that's beautiful. And I can't think of anything more natural than what naturally comes to your mind. So to tell me that like something that came to my mind without me even asking for it is wrong or gross or dirty or anything like that to me is just like bananas because like the things that happen in your head who who needs to know who who needs to care like that's kind of where I come down on that one so I think there's no such thing as like a you can't hurt somebody with a fantasy you can hurt somebody with action but you can't hurt somebody with a fantasy and so I think it's great to have fantasies and you should definitely explore those and if they're coming from a place that worries you I think you should explore that too maybe with uh you know third party or something like that but I think that uh it should all like you should let it wash over you yeah um um I think about fantasies similar to you you know like and then in an additional way like I say fantasies is something that um you know lives in your head and you have the choice whether you want to um, share it out of your head or not. And if you share it out of your head, you have the opportunity to turn it into a role play. Um, but that's also because you've discussed it and consented with someone, right? Um, so I agree, no fantasy is bad, uh, no fantasy. You can take what goes into your head and really you know, grapple with it, journal about it, do what you want, but it really isn't um, a bad thing. That's just like saying like, I had a dream and now I'm a horrible person because I dreamt that I murdered someone. So I'm a murderer now, um, that, that makes no sense. But we, we go to, to that morality thing, but something that comes up again a lot for me is um, I always go to power, right? Because even like with fantasy, right? Um, it it kind of connects with a lot of the things that we've already said, like when we fantasize about something, right? Um, whether, whether we're the receiver or the giver, that, that actually makes a difference, right? Uh, for a lot of people. Sometimes, sometimes as a receiver, we can sometimes accept something a little more because we're the one receiving it and we know ourselves, right? Well, you know, um, but if we are the giver of this thing, then there's, there's, there's a more of a, uh, an issue there because that's where the morality comes in also. Well, in both ways, but this is where the, the doer, this is where the monster comes in. This is where the, the horrible person comes in. But this, we think about the horrible person because we go directly to violence. And what happens is that we bypass the conversation of power. That's it, like this is power. Pretty much when we are engaging sexually, romantically, or anything with anyone, we're always engaging with power. And because we don't talk about that stuff, um, we don't even know what power we hold in this engagement. So when, when I am talking to someone, I know what, you know, uh, in that moment, what power I hold and what power this person holds. And that gives me a better understanding of uh, my own agency and what, how I can negotiate and speak with this person or not. So I, I keep going to this idea of um, this lack of understanding of power um, and also the power associated or lack thereof with the binary, right? Because um, we're talking about the giver and the receiver. And most often when we think about giver and receiver, it's either masculine, male, um, giver, uh, receiver, feminine, you know, woman, and that's not always the case. Thanks to people who've been putting questions in the chat. We'll be getting to those uh, uh, pretty soon, so thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for those uh, responses, because uh, I like the analogy with dreams when it comes to fantasy, because uh, for me, like I'm someone who's a heavy dreamer and also a heavy fantasizer. And both of those realms, I feel like more than anything can really inform me as to what's going on in my subconscious. And I know that it's all in the subconscious realm. There are fantasies that I actively feed into and I like them and I bring them up as in like, some dreams. I have tried lucid dreaming and I've tried to stay in certain dreams more. But also when I have dreams and fantasies that I find not helpful to me or uh, you know, prob uh, problematic or troublesome for any reason, um, it, that can be really informative as to like, what do I do with that? What does that say about what am I struggling with these days? Like if I'm having recurring nightmares, if I'm having recurring fantasies that disturb me, I think it's a just good information to observe and then think about how we want to actually, what do we want to do with that? So with that uh, question, I actually want to ask you, Jeremy, like what is it, what are, what is the, the fear and concerns that are seem to be coming up around? Uh, fantasies, especially from like the legislative perspective, uh, from like the social media uh, censorship perspective. Why are people scared of uh, these like fantasies, especially as we work in the field of childhood sexual abuse prevention, when it comes to fantasies that involve children, involve basically parties that cannot consent? Yes. Well, I think there's a theory that um, uh, thoughts lead to actions. Um, now, obviously, there is a relationship between fantasy and reality, but it's not a straightforward one. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's, there's research on this, there's more research ongoing right now. In fact, Prostasia Foundation is funding research into what are the impacts, both, both positive and negative, um, on um, on sexual behavior from fantasies and uh, from sexual outlets, victimless sexual outlets. Um, uh, again, those things like art, role play, cosplay, dolls, uh, fan fiction, film and TV, anything can be an outlet for sexual feelings. Um, and uh, so the fear that legislators have, which is not really based on research, but the fear is that you know, one leads to the other. So um, in some countries, and increasingly in this country, um, there are laws that will ban fantasy as such um, on the assumption that it creates a tolerance for real, real child abuse. Um, so as an example of that, I mean, there are many examples, but uh, just to take a couple of recent ones, um, in Canada, there was a prosecution of the author of a horror novel, a version of Hansel and Gretel, um, which contained a scene of child sexual abuse in it. And the author, who's a mainstream novelist published by a mainstream publisher, uh, he was prosecuted for child pornography um, because of this one scene in a, in a very long book that contained a, a, a depiction, depiction of fictional child sexual abuse. Um, and the Supreme Court of Canada, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, provincial court uh, decided not only was he not guilty, but that Canada's child pornography law was unconstitutional to the extent that it stopped people from exploring fantasy. Because as the court pointed out, this would also prevent survivors of child sexual abuse from writing their biographies or from writing fictionalized accounts of what happened to them which is actually very common. Often a technique for survivors to process their trauma is actually to, uh, to, to, to fantasize about it and to, to write it into a, a fiction or a role play because it gives them more control over it. You know, if they were, when they were actually undergoing abuse, they had no control. They were, uh, they were, they were literally being victimized, but, but maybe they still felt some, some, some confusing feelings, including maybe some pleasurable feelings. And, and one way that um, survivors often sort that out and uh, come to terms with that is through fantasy. So that uh, Canadian law is just one example of, of going too far. And the court, in fact, found that it did go too far. But in the United States, we also have that. There's a lawsuit, um, sorry, a prosecution for obscenity of a person who ran a fiction archive 
And in fact, yesterday, uh, he was due to be sentenced for that because the court did find him guilty of an obscenity crime for hosting fictional stories um, that uh, describe sort of child sexual abuse. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and in the United States, there's a huge backlog, and in many other countries too, there's a huge backlog of uh, prosecutions of real child abusers, people who are distributing real child sexual abuse materials, child pornography, if you will. Um, there's a massive backlog of investigations, and yet we're prosecuting someone for fiction. That's literally taking money away that could be used for real victim support um, and, and putting it, uh, you know, wasting that money on prosecuting someone over fiction. Um, so, so that's how, how countries are, are overstepping, but also internet platforms are overstepping as well. Um, they, they tend to um, define what's allowed and what's not allowed, not in terms of harm to real children, but in terms of the um, abstract concept of sexualization um, of minors. Now, sexualization is a real thing, but uh, oftentimes that word is really just a code for adults being uncomfortable. It's not really about you know, children. It's, it actually centers the adults' feelings. It centers you know, my discomfort at someone else you know, reading a story or writing some art. Um, and I feel like we, we shouldn't be centering adults' sensibilities and, and discomfort over children. And, and that's too often what the platforms do. So you will have um, art that is taken down, you'll have um, uh, fiction, cosplay, all of these things that are taken down from mainstream platforms. And what that does is um, it, it actually impacts on, um, on marginalized communities that don't really have any other way to express their sexuality. Uh, when Tumblr, for example, cracked down on sexual content, there were thousands of communities of people who wanted to, and Megan can talk to this as well, in fact, maybe she will, um, uh, people who really didn't see themselves represented in mainstream porn or, um, or elsewhere in the mainstream media who were able to find a, a place where they could represent themselves sexually um, uh, online. And, and that was taken away because Tumblr found it too hard to go after actual child sexual abuse. So they said, well, let's just, let's just get rid of sex. It's just, it's just too hard. Um, and that the harms of that, uh, as I've said, you know, disproportionately uh, fall on those who are sexually stigmatized, but who are not uh, contributing to the, the abuse of actual minors. So um, in fact, can we, can we, turn to Megan and, and see if she has any thoughts on on that side of things. I mean, I'm always happy to tell that story because it annoys me so much. But <laughs> but basically, like I was on Tumblr and like I'm fat. Uh, and so fat liberation is definitely a thing that I'm into along with sexual liberation because all of this stuff goes together. Um, but so Tumblr was where I found a home and I made a lot of content, kink content, pornographic content, things like that, in a way that was really authentic to me and creative for me and really great for my body image. Like, I never had a better relationship with my body than when I was making porn content for Tumblr. And they came and Fosta Sesta came along and I lost my like 3,000 followers and the ways that I was getting ready to monetize or monetizing my blog for, uh, you know, actual uh, income. And so, and so I'm white. There is a place for me almost everywhere in this world. There are not necessarily friendly spaces for people of color, obviously. And that was another part of the community that I was able to get more in touch with, learn a lot more about. And they had a home there too, because it wasn't just the like whitewashed, really clean uh, images that you see of kink that are, you know, between like two skinny people and that kind of thing. So, um, so I lost a lot in losing Tumblr. And I also think we lost a lot in the way of like ways to spread information to kids, like actual information, sex ed, because I know a lot of sex educators who also lost their platforms when that happened. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's that. Those are the stories that we've been hearing as well from sex educators, sex workers, anyone who's uh, you know expressing their sexuality, um, and especially sex education for children, right? Because like the work we do at the Heal Project is so much around the antidote to what's happening, the violence that's happening is actually empowering everyone, most importantly children, because they are so vulnerable, with correct information, with good information about relationship building, so that they can really find find trusting adults, really build relationships uh, and understand what's happening around them, hopefully from somewhere besides porn for the first time, right? So, and, and even that voice gets censored in our work at The Heal Project, anytime, you know, especially we did recent uh, Instagram and Facebook, they keep updating their terms of the community guidelines. So every time they do that, we have to come up with these new creative ways of actually just, just say things like, hey, talking with children about sexuality uh, and, you know, education around that, is a good thing that gets censored because we have said the words children and sex, sex sexuality in the same sentence right um, but you brought up the idea of kink and uh, you know how all of that gets censored and also sex work uh, Ignacio I know you are very outspoken uh, around both your um, as someone who is into age play and uh, you know the, the taboo kinds of play uh, as well as someone who has experience with sex work so I want to hear from you more around uh, this this uh, kind of environment that's happening right now and if you have received any backlash doing this work um, as someone who's founded the HEAL project to uh, you know take a sexually liber liberatory approach to uh, uh, violence prevention. You know, it's funny because I, I think we talk about this a lot too, Aredvia. I, I think people tell us all the time that the work is important, it's good, and we got something here. Like, this is the angle, right? This is the angle. Everyone's like, yes, sex education, absolutely, holistic sex. Yeah, we need to be talking about this, right? Um, even even the, the ways in which we're dealing with stuff now on social media that we can't say sex anymore, we're literally going backwards. We're going backwards. And what we're doing is doing the same thing that we've done to children. And it's basically like, don't talk about sex. It's just abstinence. And that's it. If we don't talk about it, then nothing will happen. And that was my upbringing. And that was completely false, right? Um, I was sexually abused. I was having sex at the age of like, 14, got pregnant really young, right? There's a trajectory to this because it, 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 it like feeds on itself, this shame and secrecy and this, and this let's completely ignore it. And we see this all the time. This is a, this is a, a technique that we use all the time. Like uh, even with this ridiculousness of the, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, sports and stuff with trans kids in sports, which they have no statistics on this stuff saying, well, we just won't do sports, basically. Let's just stop. When, when it was LGBT students in schools, they were like, oh, we cannot have LGBT groups. So let's just cancel all groups. So everyone, you know, so we, we do these constantly and it consistently backfires. It's always wrong when we do this. Like, why do we keep going there? <laughs> why do we keep going to the eliminate everything? And if anything, we have to run towards it. We, um, the, to, to me, having these conversations and having a complete cultural shift is how we talk about sex as a, as a life skill of holistic sexuality that young people, everyone gets to talk about this. It changes everything. It changes everything because you literally have you're learning the skills from a young age not waiting until you're a teenager not waiting until you're away at college not waiting until the first time you're raped because that is the that that's what happens not waiting until the first time a guy gives you attention right because all this other time your parents were fearful they kept you on the lock and key they didn't teach you anything about sex they told you to keep your legs closed right this is something that we all do and we do it out of fear and this fear actually it builds on itself it does exactly the same the very thing that we're trying not to have happen right and then we just keep on doing it so to me this is a really scary thing that's happening right now with the uh, us you know not being able to say sex on social media and these uh, thought you know thought policing um situations and everything that's happening with sex workers right now losing all type of just, um, you know, um, safety nets for themselves, you know, um, and the different kinds of sex work that's out there that's really um, um, uh, 
it's really horrible for a lot more um, people. And I, when I usually talk, when I talk about sex work, I talk about, I've been a part of sex work, um, but the sex work I have done has been a, a privileged sex work. I have not had to be on the, uh, on the streets. I have not had to do that. And so there is a huge privilege over that. I've done pornography, I've done, you know, um, massages and dancing and things like that, right? Um, but the, to me, it is, um, it is really about this uh, this reframing of of everything. It is really a reframing. I I keep saying everything, and I know that people are like, no, not er it is everything. It is everything because uh, uh, these are very much connected. And I think when we talk about preventing uh, child sexual abuse and ending it, um, to me, this is a, a, a humongously like huge core piece of work that every movement needs to be taking a part of because child sexual abuse is a wedge issue for the criminal justice system that completely fucks over people of color, poor people, right? Um, it is the one thing that people can't get over when you talk about, when we're talking about getting rid of uh, prisons or defunding police and stuff, you throw in sexual abuse or child sexual, well, I'll kill that motherfucker. I'll put him in jail. I want that motherfucker to be raped, right? We, we do that because that is the wedge, right? Because such fear. Um, so um, yeah, I, I keep, uh, it, it is really the, the reframe, the reframe and going back to a place where we're not eliminating, but actually adding and saying, we must be talking about sex. We must be talking about BDSM. We should be talking about porn with kids and saying, this is a fantasy, right? And this is reality, right? Fantasies are okay. When you're older, you know, that you can see this fantasy stuff, right? Like if we talked about porn in a way that was just like, it's there, it's there to access for adults. It's a fantasy-based thing. It is not reality. We can pick things from reality and make them into fantasy, but it is not reality. And that's the thing I think that a lot of people talk about in terms of why porn is so horrible and, um, and so horrible for children and all that. But when kids find it, they don't have any kind of, um, they have nothing. All they see is what they see. And so this is just brand new shit coming in that they have no explanation for. And imagine if they had someone talking to them prior to that, um, understanding what they're seeing and, and talking, talking it through with them. We don't do that currently. And so the people who are, CSA survivors, um, they grow up, right? I'm, I'm an adult now and that has fucked with my entire life, right? And, um, and it, it, it's something that doesn't go away. So again, I go back to the fact that this is not a childhood issue. It's something that happens in childhood and continues on in some way, shape or fashion for the rest of your life. Thank you, Ignacio. I want to acknowledge that we're having some really great questions coming in through about fantasies more and the content, and we will get to get to that shortly. We'll have a Q&A session, but first, uh, I want to just touch on the uh, point that we are running this event as a panel and fundraiser, and we want to talk a little bit about the specifically why that is, is that the, the funding world for organizations like us who are doing sexual violence prevention, especially CSA prevention, through this specific lens of like, let's stop limiting everything and censoring everything and let's actually give information in the open society to people and empower people to make better decisions for themselves their children and all of that so uh, we will touch on that and then we'll get to all of your questions uh, what i would say from our end at the heal project is that uh, what we've run into over and over in, throughout the years, uh, applying for grants, trying to do fundraising. Like Ignacio said, we get a lot of people who really understand what we're doing. Mostly a lot of kinky people, a lot of people who've done work in sexual liberation. They, they are the ones who actually get the connection, but the others understand this. However, there's no room for this conversation in philanthropy because the way we're talking about sexual violence prevention is a cultural shift. Is that, yes, we could, you know, limit this thing, censor this thing, write an algorithm that will delete every content that has the word sex or child in it. And that might help like one kid one time for like one year. 
But that is not a real solution because we're not addressing the root causes of why sexual violence is happening, that we are creating harm doers, we are creating victims in a culture where conversations around sex and bodies and boundaries and agency are just eliminated from public education, from uh, you know pa parental education and all of that. So we keep running into an issue in the world of funding because funders don't really like to hear like, this kind of conversation around, well, you know what, we can't really actually eliminate CSA until we have racism happening, classism happening. We can do so much of education for poor kids when they don't have shelter and food. Like they are at risk of CSA because they don't have shelter and food and they need to do a lot of survival work that is putting them at risk. So these are not exactly easy things for philanthropy world to be like, oh great, after two years that we gave you this much money, you're gonna like show us these numbers of how many children were saved from CSA. So therefore we end up in a place where we basically are running our organizations one day at a time. It's like, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. And hoping that really at this point, I'm really looking at this as a grassroots movement. It's not really relying on the philanthropy world anymore, not really relying on big institutions, because really, honestly, the way we're approaching fundraise, the fundraising and the way we're approaching this issue requires dismantling the very systems that has put money in the pockets of the people who didn't want to give money away to organizations who are doing anything, you know, sexual violence prevention or all of that. So that's out from our side. I want to hear from Prestasia as to what has been some of your funding, uh, fundraising challenges. Yeah, well, I think I was very naive when Prestasia started in thinking that other, you know, that, that mainstream fundraisers, uh, mainstream funders would be able to see the value of what we were doing and would be like, oh yeah, we, you know, this is, our current approach is harmful. Maybe we should be offering a different approach. But um, unfortunately, you're right. I mean, the, the, the structures that support our current approach to CSA, which is all about uh, mass incarceration, censorship, surveillance, those really are built upon capitalism, uh, which is in turn built upon racism, which is, you know, um, uh, all of these, these structures of power that really, until we dismantle those, we're not going to be able to change the way that the uh, major philanthropic sector um, tackles this problem. Um, that's why there's been so much focus on, you know, organized sex trafficking as a, um, a focus and, and why there's been so much focus on the idea of pedophiles as being this uniquely evil class of person who are the only people that we need to worry about. And if only we eliminated all the pedophiles, then suddenly there would be no child sexual abuse. Now, these, these, these things are firstly wrong, but secondly, government knows that it's wrong. The major funders know that it's wrong. They just don't care because that narrative, you know, supports, supports their sort of, you know, capitalist classes racist society um and and it's scary for us to be you know kind of pulling aside the curtain and saying you actually know um actually there, there is no massive industry of you know children being uh, kidnapped off the streets and and pedophiles in positions of power like that's all bullshit um that's that's challenging the narrative that has been pushed by these other groups for so long, you know, the stranger danger narrative. Now, I'm not saying that there's not some truth in, in stranger danger, but as, as an overall narrative, it's been false. Um, uh, and, and that's what these major groups have built their fundraising model upon. Uh, they've built it upon fear and upon uh, the idea that, you know, heteronormative sexuality is, is safe and other sexualities are unsafe. Um, and I don't want to be naming names too much because I know that one, there's at least one of these major child protection groups that registered to attend this event. But I will say that um, the stigmatization of children themselves for what is actually normative and, and, and age appropriate for them um, is part and parcel of um, the the approach that our society is taking to, to child sexual abuse. And there are so many kids that are terrified of themselves, of their own sexuality. And they, they're worried like, oh my God, am I a pedophile? Because, you know, I'm 17 and I like a, a 15 year old, you know? Um, or in fact, there was a case of a 17 year old girl who uh, created artwork and posted it to her blog 
And the major, the largest child protection organization from Canada, again, I'm not going to name them, um, they had this girl, the 17 year old child, arrested um, by police for posting sexually explicit art to her blog. So I actually, I, I, I'm not very well liked by some of the other organizations in this sector. And frankly, I don't care. I, you know, when this kind of thing happens, we have to point it out and say, you know what, you're doing more harm than good. You're, you're making children terrified of their own sexuality and, um, and trying to, um, and you're, you're raising barriers to help seeking. People who maybe do have fantasies um, and, and who want to make sure that they don't enact them in a non-consensual way have nowhere to turn. I mean, outside of the kink community, which is really 18 plus anyway, where do people who are under 18, who are kinky, um, uh, go to ask questions about this stuff? Um, you know, it's not integrated into mainstream sex education. Um, mainstream sex education doesn't talk about, um, I mean, even if they talk about consent, they certainly don't talk about pleasure. They certainly don't think talk about um, how, you know, fantasies that uh, you can't act on in real life can still be okay. That's not a message that we're sending um, children. Um, when we talk about porn, like porn literacy is um, being integrated into some sex ed in some places, but even when it is, the message is usually um, that it's bad unless um, it's, you know, within a very narrow class of acceptable sort of content for adults, then anything outside of that is bad and harmful and unrealistic. And oftentimes that includes consensual BDSM content. It's stigmatized from the outset. And so kids who are drawn to this, which can happen from a young age, like there are spankos who don't realize that they are spankos who are young children. Um, and, and they consider themselves to be freakish. You know, there are people who are into age play while they're still underage. Um, people who identify as littles. And again, Megan <laughs> might want to talk about that. Um, and, and they have to know, we have to find a way to tell them that even though acting this out with a partner is not appropriate in your age group, having these feelings and identifying in this way is totally fine. And, um, and it's, it's, it's a scary message uh, for, for a lot of sort of mainstream groups to talk about. And it's really important for groups like Prostasia and the Heal Project um, to be able to get support to get that message out there. And since we can't rely on mainstream funders, we are relying on our communities. Now, um, I would just like to say, we haven't gotten any donations since we started this live stream. And let's, let's change that. Uh, if you're listening in, and you think that the work that we're doing is important, go to prostasia.org slash fundraiser. Now it's not just gonna to go to Prostasia, we're gonna divide the proceeds of this 50-50 with the Heal Foundation. So don't worry that it's just on our domain. Um, but I want you, if, if this is reson any of this is resonating with you, please go to prostasia.org slash fundraiser and you can donate however much you want, whether it's $10, $20, $50, $100, We'll love you for it, and and you will be making a difference. I just want to acknowledge we did have one. Somebody has uh, donated, so I don't want them to feel like we didn't notice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Megan, would you like to speak more about uh, some of the... Oh, actually, Ignacio, did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, um, I just wanted to say about like we're talking about fantasies, like fantasies is not abuse, but I'm, it, I just started thinking about, you know, young people, right? Young people, uh, mostly everything that we think of as young people is fantasy, right? Because we haven't had the experience yet. And so all we're doing is fantasizing. And most of the stuff we fantasize is shot down, right? Because we're expressing our fantasies all the time and then parents or adults are saying you can't do that you, you you're too young or you that's that's horrible or that's you know shameful whatever the case may be so we we're you know learning from a, a really early age that fantasy is okay when you're like a toddler and then when you get to a certain age we kind of forget it and this is what i love the 
in the kink community role playing is one of my favorite things to do and i love age playing as well but it's like um i had to learn to get to a place of being comfortable enough to want to do you know um to to sift through those fantasies and see what i was going to pull out to actually do role playing with and that's scary when you've never ever been able to do that because when you think about it fantasy is you know whether we it comes into our heads or we we invite the fantasy into our head it's uh, vulnerable it's very very vulnerable and it's a part it can be a part of 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 uh, you know a process we may be going through you know and to talk about that especially in a in a space in a society where taboo things are really shut down um it is uh a really tough place to get there and we usually talk about this stuff as you know um healing too like turning those fantasies into role plays or actions or using um those you know um using those uh images in your head and and having power to change them for yourselves and all that but that takes again the the understanding the resources the information to even get to that place so i'm, I'm thinking a lot about how we just shut down kids from just a young age, everything is a no because of fear. Yes, definitely. Megan, I want to actually pose the first question to you that we have as someone who works with kids and uh, is, you know, has kids in, in their life. And so the question, and also is into age play. Um, the one question that came in was around. I just lost the train of the questions. <laughs> I am sorry. It was about fantasies that uh, basically overindulging in fantasies. And if, is mm -hmm. there the whole question around, you know, the line between where does it get intrusive? What can we do about it? Where does it get dangerous? Um, in your experience, how do you relate to that? Um, so, yeah, as I said, kind of in the beginning, I don't think that there's a bad fantasy. Any behavior I think can become problematic or compulsive for you <clears throat> if so in that situation something like overindulging not getting to your life not doing your work not you know only sitting in your fantasies is probably i think the only way you can overindulge in them otherwise as i said before let it wash over you and as far as the uh i'm looking at the question too as far as the implications for those sexually attracted to children i can't think of a better, safer outlet than your own fantasies in your own mind. There's no victim there. There's nothing wrong with your fantasies. Again, like, unless you, when you take it out of your head and you act on it, then you need to think about consent. You need to think about uh, who can be hurt and if you're hurting yourself. But I think as long as it's in your head, um, you know, we talked about intrusive thoughts. I definitely think there's value if you're having thoughts that are really causing you a lot of distress, there's value in talking to a counselor, a friend who's understanding, a peer support group, something like that. I think it's always worth exploring things that are causing you uh, to feel uncomfortable. But I don't think that, like, you do have control of your fantasy in that when you've decided this is the fantasy I want to follow, you can choose where your fantasy goes. Um, you can't control what comes to your head naturally. You just can't. Um, and trying to force yourself to, like that's a big part of the no that Ignacia was just talking about. It's a big part, like just knocking it down. No, you can't have this even inside your own head. And I think that is actually kind of tragic to think that you can't even have the thoughts that are in your head. Um, so I think fantasy is a great, uh, really awesome way to uh, work with minor attraction without children being in danger. Can I add to that? Um, I would like to encourage people who do find that their thoughts or fantasies are becoming intrusive. Um, or in, fa in fact, some people who have thoughts about um, childhood sex or child sexual abuse um, aren't doing so from a position of it's turning them on. Sometimes it is distressing. And that can actually be a symptom of a condition uh, called POCD, pedophilic obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, um, this is something that you probably shouldn't diagnose in yourself. Um, but if you are having distressing feelings, particularly if you're starting to worry about whether you 
um, you know, uh, have pedophilia um, or uh, may act out, if that's becoming distressing to you, then definitely you should um, seek some help for that. And it may just be to reassure you, um, or it may be to give you some techniques, um, you know, like cognitive behavioral techniques or whatever, to, um, to deal with these intrusive thoughts as they come uh, through. And there are good places to go for support that are kin friendly and that are inclusive of marginalized sexualities um, and gender identities. Um, so I'm based in Oakland, California, and we have a group here called the Bay Area Open Minds, which is a group of therapists who uh, specialize in, in this sort of thing. If you happen to, if you want to talk to someone specifically about minor attraction, you know, having thoughts of, of attraction towards minors, uh, then there are therapists uh, that you can locate through a group called Before You Act. Um, Before You Act have a register of therapists who uh, deal with those sorts of problems and issues. And um, so that's a good place to reach out. Um, there's, uh, you know, people are legitimately fearful sometimes of just going to their neighborhood therapist and coming out with something like, hey, I'm having thoughts about children. Um, because some therapists don't have the right training or the right mindset um, or the desire to serve uh, people who have that uh, sort of issue. Um, so um, that's totally legitimate to be fearful about talking to a random therapist about something that's so personal. Um, but there definitely are resources out there. And if you're having trouble finding someone to talk about something that's very personal like that, um, then you can talk to me at Prostasia and I'll refer you on, or you can go, as I said, to groups like uh, Bay Area Open Minds and Before You Act um, to get some resources there. Thank you, Jeremy. I really appreciate you providing resources because uh, I know in our work, uh, working with uh, MAPS or minor attractive people isn't the center of our work, but we do uh, like to address it uh, as in from the perspective of not demonizing people who are attracted to minors and having a conversation around ways that, uh, you know, harm reduction can be done. And also just really the fact that not everyone uh, who's a pedophile is a harm doer and offender and not in every harm doer of children has an attraction to children. And I think making those distinctions are just so important in this work. Um, I know like uh, one of the, in one of our uh, Q&A posts that uh, we did about a year ago, uh, we were answering a question from someone, uh, a, a, a soon to be a father who um, had attractions to uh, children and was really concerned about becoming a father and not having any way of navigating uh, these feelings with be becoming a parent. So we posted this question on our social media with a, with a response and it was really shocking uh, to see how many people without really even engaging with the material would uh, issue death sentence for this father the soon to be father who is has never offended from as far as we know never offended is actually seeking uh, some uh, way of addressing the feelings that are coming up and actually being thoughtful about okay what does it say about me how do i manage these feelings when i have my own child right so i really appreciate the the resources you're providing i want to jump to the next questions about voyeurism and uh actually i'm going to answer that one myself but i want to ch uh, challenge you all to uh let me know what you think about it the question is about what if uh, you're a voyeur and not in the binary i think that's from earlier when we we're talking about the the doer and the receiver of an act um and you know what is the kind of the morality perhaps or the situation with that what i would say about that because uh, for myself, in my experience, um, in my late teenage years, so it's like 18, I was 18, 19 years old, I was in college, just had access to high speed internet, and just was out of my parents' house. And immediately, a lot of what I really was interested in, uh, in terms of online porn, was uh, really violent porn. So things that, you know, absolutely would cross, was just really complicated. And at a time, I didn't really have a good way of knowing, like, okay, no, right now I can be like, okay, this kind of production looks like this is a legitimate kind of some sort of porn, but this one really looks like, I don't know what the fuck is happening, 
probably no consent was ever obtained in this situation. But at the time, I didn't know that. And all I knew was that I had this really unstoppable attraction to seek uh, material online, some of which may have been um, actually like sexual violence film, not even porn. And uh, for, for a while, I, had, I was really struggling with uh, being a voyeur of this. So I was also a young feminist. I was working in sexual violence prevention and rape you know, uh, prevention and helping survivors at the time. And the guilt and shame of engaging in this voyeur role uh, who is coming across some of these videos that may actually be rape really would haunt me, right? And I would be overcome with shame and guilt around it. I, I was not discussing this with anybody um, I was just exploring my own sexuality. I, I started having sex around that time. I was actually in an abusive relationship that was sexually abusive at the time. So a lot of complicated angles from this. But now that I look back at it from, uh, you know, it, it, almost a decade later, I actually really find that I wish I didn't have to go through so much guilt. Right. I know it's complicated to be a voyeur uh, and sometimes voyeurism provides the kind of uh, material support for um, for sexual violence being filmed and put online that is unintended, but it is a reality. And I understand there is a gray area there, but also what I understand is that. I honestly don't know the impact of my singular voyeurism on how much this material is being produced or not produced. What I know is that having access to that, to I wish I had more information before I had access to that content, but even just being a voyeur of that content, what it really helped me at the end was understand that, okay, like I'm not the only person in this world who's sitting around overcome by like rape fantasies and violent sexual fantasies. I am not the only person and that by itself, even if nobody around me is the, the kind of person who would understand me, there are some strangers online who would. And that was in itself helpful. Again, less than ideal situation, but at this point I'm trying to remove that kind of guilt and shame that comes from voyeurism. I think you answered that one very completely already. <laughs> the, the one thing I might say is the same thing that we say in other situations that like, so voyeurism, if you're just sitting back and watching, not bothering anybody, I can't stop you. Like if you're sitting at a cafe and I'm on the street, uh, there are rules and dungeons often about like looky loos and that kind of thing. So just be aware of the fact that as a voyeur you can still have an effect on people like if you're actively voyeuring uh in in you know a situation like that it, it's worth remembering that when it comes out of your head you are still in need of consent that would be the only thing i'd add does this also add into i was wondering when we were going to talk about pride and kink um because i'm wondering if this comes into uh, the current discourse about uh, you know kinksters being at pride and we know that some parents take their kids to pride um, and so of course you still have to be street legal when you're at pride um, because you know that, that's that's the, the red line that the city lays down um, but should there be any uh, limit on how you express your sexuality or sexual identity um, uh, as a kinkster and as a queer person um, in a public space where kids are there. Now, I have opinions on this, but I know that Megan particularly has opinions on this. Would you like to express those for us here? I mean, so I, I've kind of gone on record now as saying that I don't think that pride is for kids, which doesn't mean that I think kids shouldn't go. I think kids should go. I think it's not for them in that it's really for like, so Stonewall wasn't that long ago. <laughs> uh, to disrespect our elders this quickly is just really, really sad. And then, and kink was a part of the beginning of it. Kink is the, is part of the foundation of it. And so like, telling a leather daddy he can't be there in his leathers, you might be telling somebody who was at Stonewall that they can't be a pride and be who they are. And so, so for me, kink absolutely belongs at pride. It's, I can't separate it from this part of my identity and this part of my identity. 
I am a kinky person. It is part of my sexuality. It is part of my queerness as well. I'm not, uh, you know, vanilla queer and kinky straight or anything like that. Like it's all together. And so I can't think of a better place than pride to express these things. Pride should be the safe space to express these things. And so, you know, with the corporatization of it and trying to make a queer Karen happy so that, you know, she doesn't have to explain anything to her kids, <laughs> uh, doesn't feel like what pride is for. I feel like, you know, you can have a lot of backyard barbecues and separate things that are totally kid friendly and places where you can contextualize everything for them. But I don't feel that pride has that responsibility to your kids. I think it has to be a welcoming place for everyone. Um, but you need to have the conversations with your kids about what they're going to see. You need to contextualize it for them. Thank you, Megan. Oh, Ignacio, go ahead. I, I was just going to say that as a, as a parent and as a person who has always, uh, my daughter is an adult now, but when she was a kid, she went to you know, all prides with me all the time. We marched, all the things. And, and I always expected to see kinksters. As a matter of fact, I looked for them, right? And so my daughter saw this from the age she was four up until, I don't know, not a problem, never a problem because I never made it a problem. That's just somebody with their butt cheeks hanging out. And that's the way, that's what they want to wear today. That's it. I think we complicate things so much when it comes to young people because it's all of our hangups. It's all of our stuff. And um, I think that where, you know, if, when pride happens, uh, there are queer parents, there are queer kinksters, there are queer, uh, you know, everyone who's queer should be there, right? And if you have kids, all right, be there. And that I think that is this is I think this is to the point of if we were already having conversations very openly and honestly with kids about like how um, different people express their sexuality uh, or their life, um, it wouldn't be uh, something so horrific because if it is street legal, that means that anytime you walk out the house, you could actually run into anybody dressed the same way. So it's not about pride, really. It's about a concentrated <laughs> amount of people. <laughs> really being okay with their sexuality and that uncomfortableness when it is around children. Thank you, Ignacio. I want to send this other question your way as well, but definitely hear from all of our panelists uh, about how the, you know, how the argument that's used a lot of times for uh, depicting sexual acts of uh, children is that it can be used by predators to groom children. Uh, and that's why, like, that's the argument is like, we should just try to eliminate all of this because, so that no predators would have access to it for grooming purposes. Uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, this approach and this argument? It's bullshit. It's just bullshit. Um, like what, what, it's the same thing as like eliminating all the stuff. Like we're eliminating ourselves from the process about communicating, talking, uh, prevention, all of the stuff that we're supposed to do. We're trying to just eliminate the work by eliminating the thing, right? Let's just get rid of that. Now we don't have to talk about it. it, it um, whether whether if it is stopping that action only drives people underground to do that action even more i'd rather know what people are doing i want to know this is why the dark web exists and all that stuff right because when when there is secrecy and shame people find these ways and then nobody knows about it i want things to be open and out and we're talking about things um, because that shifts the culture if it is so it's still taboo it's secret, 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 shame, shame, shame. Nobody's gonna share. Now let's find a way to do this and harm. And then we harm people in the, in, in the midst of that um, because of that fear, shame, and secrecy. Can I add to that? Um, Please. I'd like to, I, th I feel like grooming is often a word like sexualization, which is a black box in, to which we can sort of hide all of our you know, stigmatizing attitudes. Um, and just pass it off as being concerned for children. But it, once again, grooming is often, I mean, yes, grooming is a real thing, um, but the way that the term grooming is used is often just used to try and say, you know, all you queer people, you just have to get, you know, get, get back into the closet. We don't want to see you. We don't want to hear you. Um, you know, we don't want to know about what you do. Um, and um, so is it true that people, that children can be groomed with, uh, um, 
you know, sort of like DDLG imagery or, uh, you know, Lollicon, Chodokon. Yes, they can. They can also be groomed with candy. They can also be groomed with adult pornography. Um, you know, it's not the content that's the problem. It's the act of trying to, um, you know, s s create a sexual relationship with a child that is the problem. And that's what we need to focus on, not on whatever means are, you know, used by someone to establish that relationship with a child. Thank you, Jeremy. I think uh, what I want to see, I want to say that uh, I want to uh, live in a world, I want to see uh, per perpetrators try to groom children who uh, know their own agency, who know about sex and sexuality, who are aware of their own bodies. I want them to try to do that and be unsuccessful as opposed to, you know, try to find different ways to stop them from grooming. And most importantly, I want to see a society where there are less people who are interested in grooming children because there are ways for them to actually express their sexuality without harming children. Like we, I want to not only just have more children who are not easy to be groomed, but also have less people who are interested in that to begin with, right? But Jeremy, I want to give this follow-up question to you about someone asked about the uh, difference between hate content and fantasy content. Uh, they pose this as a, uh, in the context of uh, content that involves children, but also things that may involve racial or hate speech. Uh, do you have any thoughts around like, do we need warnings? Do we need a way of monitoring this content or how do we know the difference? Yeah, so, well, firstly, um, when it comes to hate content that um, has a, a racial element, I'm probably not the person to talk about that because I'm not a person of color. Um, but um, I would say that for any sort of triggering content, uh, there should be content warnings. Um, if we're talking about online content, uh, it should be tagged, it should be age gated so that people know um, what they're getting into. Now, I am not in favor of censorship, as you know. However, um, content warnings um, are not the same as censorship. They're a form of um, information and empowerment. Um, and the best online platforms are the ones that do allow you to avoid stuff that is triggering for you. Um, unfortunately, the major internet platforms um, like uh, Twitter and Pornhub are not that good um, at that. Um, and in fact, the platforms that are run by sex workers or by fans or by people who um, are actually from the communities that they're serving tend to be better at that. Um, Prostasia works with a fan platform called FanNexus, for example, and there's a much better known um, fan platform called An Archive of Our Own, which is for fan fiction. And they've been around for donkey's years and they have an excellent system and they always have had an excellent system um, for letting you know what you're about to read. Um, and uh, they even have a way to tell you if, if you don't want spoilers, like for example, maybe there's a death in the story and you don't want to be spoiled for that. They even have a tag which says, we're not going to tell you what's happening, but if you want to continue reading, it's at your own risk. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we have to take responsibility for triggering content, whether it's sexual or violent, or you know, uh, evokes sort of um, you know, hateful, hateful thoughts. Um, we, as content creators, we need to take responsibility for making sure that um, people are uh, consenting to what uh, we're showing them. And um, it's actually in some ways easier to do that um, in kinky um, spaces than it is in vanilla spaces, because, um, you know, if it's a sex party, uh, you know, you can have a notice on the door saying, you know, there's going to be a... Um, there's going to be an age play scene here or there's going to be um, a space for a um, uh, even a, a you know, uh, needle uh, play needle, needle play, play or or whether yeah something something that could squick people out um, and same same online in online platforms we have the ability to do that so um, I think that is um, a, a valid uh, and, and productive way that we can express ourselves freely and not be censored, but also be mindful of how our um, sexual expressions are going to affect other people. 
Thank you. Uh, we have a comment about, uh, you know, saying that what is the practical role of fantasy in uh, preventing CSA beyond uh, honest and comprehensive sex education? I think we touched on this a little bit, but I want to open it up to you if you have any further comments on that, um, any, any of the panelists. Can you repeat that, Aridvi? Sure, uh, it's about the practical role of fantasy in preventing CSA beyond sex education. My understanding of it is that, you know, if uh, how can someone who is perhaps um, having thoughts about, uh, about minors, uh, how can they use fantasy in order to prevent that from moving forward? If I'm incorrect, please feel free to uh, clarify in chat. That was how I read that question as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if I may, I think uh, one of the, so we've talked about role play. Role play is a really good way to uh, consensually make your fantasies as real as possible. So a uh, practical application of fantasy is, you know, so if you're minor attracted, you can't do anything with a minor that you shouldn't, you can't, um, but somebody can dress up like a minor for you and, you know, give the other mental cues that are involved. <clears throat> and that's an outlet. That is a way, uh, that's harm reduction. If uh, like, I'm happy to be an adult that gets touched instead of, you know, to, to help somebody with their fantasy instead of, you know, them feeling like they have no other option and it's always going to be in turmoil in their head and that they just can't do anything gratifying about it. Fantasy is a great way to uh, then parlay that into role play, into uh, other ways to just kind of deal with what's going on inside. And we are, Prosthesia Foundation, as I said, is funding research into this, which is being performed by um, uh, the State University of New York at Oswego um, in collaboration with Nottingham Trent University. So we have actual scientists looking into the effect of sexual outlets and uh, whether they are a practical um, uh, technique for harm reduction. Uh, so we believe that they are, and there is some evidence to suggest that they are, um, but most likely it depends on the individual as well. For some people, as I said, there's a condition called a POCD um, for which these sort of outlets may actually be harmful for a particular person because it actually spirals their thoughts into an unhelpful place. So maybe for some people, um, they shouldn't in indulge in uh, these sort of outlets, but for other people, uh, uh, they may be helpful. And um, what we don't know yet, what scientists don't know is, well, how does this translate to the entire population at large? Um, and uh, what, what seems to be the case is that if anything, at a population level, um, having uh, sexual outlets actually does positively reduce uh, real world sexual violence. And the reason we know that, uh, or the reason we suspect that to be the case, is because there are a couple of case studies um, from the Czech Republic and from Japan um, where that literally happens. They had a complete ban on pornography in those countries, and then the ban on pornography was lifted, and they did a before and after on the rates of sexual violence and the rates of sexual violence went down. So um, it's not 100% solid proof, but it's a good indication that perhaps having these outlets um, doesn't fuel sexual violence, but actually uh, does divert it into, into a safe outlet. That's fascinating, Jeremy, and actually that supports some of the studies I've read around pornography and a possible harmful impact on partner sex. So there's always this fear that if you watch porn, you're going to want to go and have that kind of sex with your partners. And the studies are showing that it's only harmful when the person watching porn does not have proper sex education or an understanding of what real sex is like. And when they do ha have that, it doesn't matter what kind of porn they watch because then they are able to distinguish between the, the difference between the two. Um, so we have that, this, this important information from the studies on porn, which I think really apply to how we think about other things in the realm of fantasy. Um, we're getting close to, not super close, we have 20 minutes left, but I just wanted to let folks know that if you have any questions that you don't want to uh, uh, put in the 
public chat you feel free to privately message me and i will read them out loud as we get to get to them um, i want to direct this next question to ignacio it's about feeling fantasy in the body arousal in the body lived history in the body power dynamics are in the body and is that what makes it feel so dangerous i saw that question and i was trying to understand the question because i um i wasn't sure where they were coming from like uh so make are they are the, is the question about um the the way that we respond to things in our body um so I wasn't sure if somebody wants to clarify. Uh, I'm not sure if they could um, write a clarification. Say it, can you say it again? So maybe I can. Sure. Um, my understanding of it is that, you know, when the fantasy feels like you, you are just feeling it so much like you are right there with it, you're in it, you are so connected to it almost in a visceral sense mm -hmm. that um, you feel like you may be just that close to wanting to, like you can't maybe uh, stand, not having it be reality anymore perhaps because it is feeling so visceral. It is basically out of your head and now inside your body. Mm. You know, it's interesting when we think about that because I, I, I sometimes just go back to uh, other, other fantasies, right? And comparing other fantasies sometimes, like, like I'm also into, um, you know, rape play and aggressive play and stuff and, in that I know how I fantasize about it as the receiver and the giver. Like I fantasize about it very intensely. It gets me off um, totally and stuff. Yeah, but when I'm out about in real life, when somebody comes near me or even like invades my space, I have a whole different reaction, right? This is not real, this is not my everyday life. And I think if we could think about it like that too, you know, like I totally get off of rape fantasies, but that doesn't mean that I'm walking out in the world and that's going to turn me on if somebody wants to touch me, grab me, or do anything, because that's that's exactly what we're talking about. There's fantasy and reality, right? And even if the fantasy feels uh, extremely well, I go back to what you know Megan keeps on saying. Is it going to harm someone? Is it going to harm me? Can I negotiate and, and get to a place where we can do this in a good way? If you can't, uh, then you know that that's the thing about working with that fantasy in a different way than maybe right because i think that we we have the the power to 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 you know move around those uh those fantasies and use them in different ways we can control a lot of things especially if we're role playing right we can have something in our brain and decide i'm going to extract this and i'm going to construct it this way you know it's in my head this way but i'm going to construct it this way this is about our own agency and power to to change things and not like just accept right this thing so i'm hope i hope i answered that correctly but I, I wanted to say one quick thing from the thing that um um we're talking about before about content warning and um what do we call it when movies have like rated r or you know like that's the, the i forget the name of that what you call them the movie rating. Or rating. yeah so uh we, I just finished doing Connecting the Dots, which is something we do at the Hill Project, where we take everyday pieces of media, movies, books, anything, and kind of talk about how this piece of media connects to, you know, talking about the prevention of CSA and talking about sex and sexual violence and stuff. And I just did this with 16 Candles. And one of the things, the 80s movie, 16 Candles, one of the things that came up was, I wish, I actually wish that every piece of media had a... Uh, uh, that not particularly a content warning but like what is what you're about to experience right because like for instance we talked about 16 candles and we talked about just how fantasy based it was like remembering when i was 13 years old watching this movie thinking this is so cool she has such a crush on this guy and all of these things that are happening right watching it now almost 50 years old i'm like oh my god there's so many fucked up things in this movie right like all of this stuff but um when young people sometimes watch you know romance movies and things about teenagers falling in love and all this stuff again this is a movie it's not porn but we're it's it's uh, seen as reality this is how teenagers function this is how they fall in love this is how they do things right and i got all my information from white teenage movies so 
I got information about teenage uh, life as, a, for, as a, for white people, which was not totally uh, true, right? <laughs> Everything that I'm watching on TV. I, and so to me, I wish that that rating would be like fantasy-based romance, fantasy-based romance. So, oh, there it is. Now we know this is, this is fantasy-based young people. This is like something we can talk about and fantasize about, right? And this is reality-based, not how we have now, reality TV, because that's not true, right? So I, I actually wish all, all everything had th those kind of contents because it's, it's more um, uh, transparent. It's transparent and it's a, it's a talking piece. And we get to see, we really get to decipher or have some experience with understanding what fantasy and reality is because we have no experience. We get things fed to us all the time, especially as young people, everything is fed to us. And so we take everything as truth. And so I think that would truly change a lot of things. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, I want to uh, read this next question and actually try to answer it myself. It's about working around trauma with childhood sexual abuse and just sexual violence and uh, whether uh, there are thoughts around uh, distinguishing between what is fantasy and what is reenacting, reinforcing trauma responses, or is that even possible, necessary, as long as everyone is consenting? Um, I think this is an interesting question because I oftentimes talk about how there is the question of acknowledging, okay, like here is my sexuality, here's my desire, here's my fantasy, my kink. And there is the other question is where did it come from? And those are two separate things that we can tackle at different times. I think it's valid for people who want to go to a place of discovering why, how did it happen? Why did I have you know, this fantasy? Well, you don't have to. You can also just look at it and manage what is in front of you right there and then. Uh, I think a lot about, uh, for example, I talk about myself and rape fantasies a lot and rape play, being interested in that a lot. Um, for a long time, I really didn't know what that was about. And I often say I had rape fantasies before I was raped and I had rape fantasies after I was raped. Um, and really, if I if I want to look at the root causes of that, these are very complicated. I never claim to actually have answers to most of these. But really, the reason is because I grew up in rape culture It's because from a very early, like as a child, the, my first memories of sexuality and my body awareness was around this awareness that my body as an AFAP person was the site of violence. Before I knew what sex was, before I knew what sexuality and relationships wow. were, I was aware that I had fantasies of like being naked as a very, very young child in front of people and feeling humiliated. And then eroticizing that fantasy as a way of coping with the fear and the horror of that whole scenario. Right. So like I've really grown up with that wiring of eroticizing a lot of things that part of it is, you know, uh, things that just the reality of the culture we live in. Part, some of my fantasies are around uh, conformity, for example, like as someone who's been, um, you know, I non-monogamous and kinky. Every once in a while I have these like fan, strong fantasies of conforming, of like being in this like heterosexual monogamous marriage with children, just so like I can be normal. And that's like a fantasy to me that like does it for me sometimes. At other times I have fantasies that are completely like something very outlier, something very taboo. So my short answer to that would be that I think it is very complicated to actually pinpoint. Sometimes it is not. Sometimes we're like, yes, like this thing happened. I started having these fantasies. They, they gotta be related. And sometimes it is just larger forces of where we live, how did we grow up, all the things in the society, the powers, the traumas that we suffer, not just from like in our personal lives, but the traumas of rape, rape culture, um, racism, uh, you know, classism, all of those traumas can show up in form of fantasy. If anyone has a follow up on that, um, please feel free to, otherwise I'll go to the next question. Okay. Um, let's see, I'll try to find my place. We have a lot of wonderful comments. I appreciate everyone who's sharing their thoughts on this. There's a question about public kink and the line between uh, where kink is considered appropriate for public space and should be explored further societally. I think we touched this a little bit on the pride and kink, but does anyone have further comments? Is, is this about um, public, like out, out in public or like public in a play party because those are two yeah very different things do you want to explore that 
on both sides. Well, I, we talked about this before. I was like, um, I would say that if you are in a play party and stuff, I know that I've been to play parties before where they had these areas or signs up for people engaging in, you know, taboo stuff, content warning and things like that. Um, um, but in, when you're out and about in the world, you know, I, I remember I used to engage in that. I had a, a dominant once where uh, I would, we would hang out in the village and I had a, a, a collar around my neck with the leash and I was walking around in the city and people were stopping and asking questions and wanting to, you know, uh, so I totally enjoyed doing that because I'm a total voyeur, but I wasn't having sex or doing anything like that. I was, uh, you know, <laughs> so um, I think that whatever is appropriate to be doing you know, out in the street. We know what we can and cannot do on the street. But if we're in a play space, I think that check in with monitors and stuff, if something seems to be maybe a little bit more taboo or even ask if you think, if you have triggers um, to find out, because um, sometimes they do separate those spaces for really intense scenes. And we don't have to agree with those scenes, but I think that I like the fact that people have the opportunity to express them. And if I don't want to see it, I know I can get away from that spot, right? That's your kink. I'm not going to yuck your kink. I'm glad that we're able to have our kinks. I think, I think context of place is important too. Like if you're, I'm not going to say you can't do it, but if you're at the park at say 11 o'clock in the morning when every mom is there with their toddler, maybe that's not your best time to do your like fetish shoot on the swings. That's something I want to do. Um, <laughs> Like, I think context does matter, uh, you know, if you're definitely going to have an underage audience, maybe rethink some of the things you're planning to do. Do I think that you can't have a collar and a leash around kids? No, I think you can absolutely. I think to some degree, the more and nobody has the obligation to do emotional labor and teach if that's not where they are. But I do think that if you are going to be more overt about it, maybe be willing to answer some questions, uh, because I do think it is an opportunity to teach if that's something you think is important. Um, and then it just helps contextualize it for people. If somebody's willing to ask you questions about it instead of just attacking you, then heck, answer the questions. You know, and that again, if it's kids, it can be done in an age appropriate way. You can give them the simple answer. This is what I'm wearing today. What do you like to wear? You know, things like that. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, read this one. It seems to be the last question. If I missed anything, feel free to leave it in the comments. I also want to check with our panelists since we started late. How do you all feel about staying five to 10 minutes to just get through the answers? If I understand if folks need to leave at three, but we will be posting the recording of this session uh, on our YouTube channels and will be emailed as well. So uh, feel free to take care of yourself when you need to. Um, this next question is, what is a good path to better accepting our fantasies? Um, they're having a difficult time accepting their fantasies because they're worried that they've trained their body and brain into getting turned on by them uh, because of all the years of porn and media and all of that exposure over the years. And so uh, even though they feel like some of them are natural attractions that they had early on, they're still unsure about how to accept all of the fantasies. You know, I keep, I keep thinking about um, that it, like we have the, the opportunity to like shift our fantasies, right? Like, so if something is, uh, there's a fantasy that you've been, um, or fantasies that you've used that, um, cause a little bit of discomfort or, or something. One, I would say, I don't think it's a bad thing when we feel a little discomfort because of course, that's just us checking in with ourselves, right? Because we, we know what the real world, right? That I would be a little, you know, <laughs> it's better that we, uh, when I'm a little uh, alert, alerted by something, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm checking in with myself. This is something big. And, and you ask yourself questions. I think in reframing that, ask yourself questions, ask, and, and even ask yourself, have I tried something new, right? Since you know that this is something you've done always and it completely turns you on, sometimes we just kind of get stagnant in something because we know what it is and what it does for us, right? So have you tried to explore and try something else? I get the same way. I can, I can get into 
a particular kind of porn and I could just or an act and do that for like a year straight right and think that this is the thing I'm always doing and then I go to explore other things and I find something else you know uh, so I, I don't think it's a this idea of training, it makes me think about uh, uh, vi uh, vibrators when people say don't use vibrators because you'll train your body not to be able to, you know, use your hands and stuff, you know. I think um, our minds are beautiful and big and unique and, and, and has the capacity um, to, uh, to shift and move and um, try, try a little bit to release some of the fear because I think the fear kind of keeps us there. And if you have friends, or anyone that you can talk with that I think that's the best medicine because a lot of times that stuff is in our heads and we're too afraid to talk to somebody but if we trust someone enough or uh, some people talking it out sometimes is enough I think the root cause is uh so like in counseling and dealing with other things that you get caught in your head with uh you work on getting back to your root cause where is the internalized anger or sadness, or in this case, uh, you know, lack of acceptance, where is it coming from? And so if you can work yourself back to that, you can see what kind of built it. And sometimes seeing that structure, you can be like, that's made of cards, I can knock that over. Um, it's not always that easy. Um, but like, sometimes if you can walk yourself back, you can get to a place where you're like, okay, so that's what happened. That's the hurdle I have to get over. Um, and so, again, like talking to a friend for me, talking to a counselor is part of that, talking to somebody outside of your head to help you. Because another thing that happens is a lot of the stigma is also trauma or it's trauma related. And um, just being able to get yourself out of that headspace, out of the trauma space and talk about it to someone. So that, because also talking about it is the best way to discover that you're not alone. Like, whatever it is you're harboring that you think you are alone with, only you are sitting with this, there is someone else out there and they're probably looking for support and companionship too. So like definitely talking about it, making it like kind of reclaiming it, making it something that it's okay to talk about. Cause what you're like, when you try to suppress it, you're really just suppressing everything around it. You're not getting, you're not making yourself safer by suppressing it. You're not, uh, keeping yourself from the thing that you think is dangerous. You're just keeping yourself from yourself really and from finding that better acceptance or that greater acceptance. If I can add to that, um, the thing that jumped out to me about the question was uh, the person feeling that they had a natural attraction to it early on. And that definitely resonated with me because I have sexual fetishes um, that persist with me today that I can remember having before I even knew what sex was. And um, so um, I also feel that a lot of the uh, interest that some people have in age play, now I think people are into age play for a lot of different reasons, okay. But I think for some people, it stems from the fact that they're coming back to a time when they were first discovering their own sexuality and they were getting turned on consciously for the first time. And they were starting to explore maybe by themselves, maybe with a friend for the first time, their bodies were changing for the first time and they were like, and they were masturbating a lot for the first time and taking themselves, and they were in a way it was sort of carefree as well. Um, hopefully, I mean, for some people who experienced that. Um, or for other people who didn't experience a happy uh, uh, childhood sexuality, but who want to place themselves back in time to act out a happy, carefree, like exciting, uh, new, novel childhood sexuality. Um, I, I believe that for, for some people, that's where the age play comes from, rather than from any sort of pedophilic, hebophilic um, uh, sexual orientation, um, which I, I feel is, is a whole separate thing and can, can also be a reason why people age play. But for many age players, they have no, in, no sexual interest in, in children, or at least not in other children. It's often their sexual interest is in themselves as a child. And I noticed that Faye 
Brown, who's one of our um, participants in the chat, was talking a little bit, bit about that. And she's an expert in this sort of thing um, because um, uh, she, uh, she, she, she'll tell you that, you know, there, there are so many reasons why these sort of feelings can come up. And it's not always one thing. It can be from trauma. It can just be from childhood positive experiences or it can be from minor attraction. And, uh, and I think if we're gonna be accepting of um, the practice of age play, we have to be accepting of whatever reasons people have for getting into it. And, um, and the same with other kinks, you know, the same with spanking, does it come from, uh, you know, a, a traumatic childhood experience? Does it come from a pleasurable childhood experiences or just does it just come out of who knows because brains are weird and because sex is weird, like, um, you know, the, the kink community is about not, uh, you know, often when people post um, this sort of um, underage content online, they're interrogated by aunties to say, well, are you, a, are you an abuse survivor? Is, is that why you're doing this? And, you know, they feel like they have to regurgitate their whole childhood trauma to be able to justify the fact that they're into this. And I feel like as a sex positive community, that's bullshit. Like we don't have to interrogate people over why they're into something the fact that they're into it is reason enough in itself and as long as it doesn't spill over into real life behaviors that are harmful to themselves or to others then that's all we need to know thank you so much jeremy i want to just acknowledge that we are at, at that original time we are staying for another 10 minutes but in case some folks are going to be leaving us i want to just uh, one last time uh, thank you for being here putting up with the technical difficulties uh, if you have donated now or if you decide to donate later uh, we will we appreciate it and also i want to address this one question before we get into some of the other topics is that for folks who for whatever reason um, don't want to donate today or have donated but are looking for other ways to also support what we're talking about today what are some of the things that we can give folks to do uh, to give this conversation a little bit more uh, strength in, in in today's society um i would say that you know if, if you can support you know and or can't another way would be um really helping us get our content out there you know like uh or letting us know about uh, someone who might be interested in uh, talking with us, funding us. Um, yeah, we're looking for people to help us, you know, get this information out uh, through social media, via email, um, any of those. So, so I'm thinking a lot about that, getting the message out and getting it to people who might be, you know, willing and able to um, provide funding, um, but don't don't, are not really like philanthropists or don't know much about you know what's going on here i was just thinking about this and uh one of the audiences that prestasia has struggled to get is the parent audience and so and one of the reasons is because parents have a knee-jerk reaction to a lot of what we're talking about which is understandable but then they tend to skip over the content so one of the things you can do to help talk to parent friends. If you've got friends who are parents and you think they could use this information or they are already doing this, make them aware of us. Let them know that we're here. They may want to donate, they may want to volunteer and just getting the information out there is important. So uh, just for us, like more specifically, I feel like the parent group is a thing. And when it comes to social media, um, like, you don't want to get into a flame war with people, but if you see someone expressing a stigmatizing attitude, maybe check them on it. Um, maybe, you know, just be, be careful you don't turn yourself into a target. But I feel like often people get away with expressing bigotry online because they feel like they're safe in doing so. And the moment that bigots don't feel safe and the moment that they start to feel like, well, maybe they're outnumbered by people who are more open-minded, then that's gonna shut down that bigotry and it's gonna open up more spaces for people to communicate more openly about these topics. 
Thank you, everyone. I would like to also add to all of that. I always want to come back to the personal uh, work that all we can all do uh, to really uh, help ourselves and those around us. And I think that can be really impactful. We talked about accepting fantasies. We talk about reaching that place of really trusting ourselves. And that's a big thing that I feel like in our culture, society, we don't, uh, we don't really learn how to do. We don't have access to the tools to do that very much. So I have found probably the most important work I've ever done is to just sit down with myself, do soul searching, figuring out how I can remove judgments around who I am, because nothing removes judgment from how I look at the world around me better than me actually doing that work with what I struggle with internally. So what I, I would just want to add that, you know, any anytime uh, you are looking at your own past traumas, you're doing healing work, you're uh, doing acceptance work and giving yourself compassion and kindness, I really believe that is violence prevention work because that has a ripple effect of how you interact with everyone around you, including children and other adults, and how you show up in your workplace. And these conversations kind of like continue on from there. And so now we have just a few five minutes left. Uh, I want to kind of open it to any last comments, any uh, thoughts you all are having. Do you think it to share throughout this uh, session? Um, you know, just bring this all of these conversations together. What would you like to leave uh, the audience with today when it comes to fantasy abuse? What's happening in the political arena there today? What's happening around the the legislation, the new laws that are right now going through? Congress, uh, what are your what is your take and uh, leave us with something to yeah uh, go through the weekend with? Um, so what I would like people to take away from this is that they really don't need to fear their fantasies. Sex doesn't need to be fearful. Fantasies don't need to be fearful. And one of the ways that you can make it. Uh, so what I was thinking about earlier a little bit was uh, like fantasies for kids like so kinksters often say that they can remember the things that they did as kids that kind of should have been a clue of what they were going to end up being into. And so for me, when I played house as a really little kid, I often played the baby. And now I age play as like mm, three to four years old. So <laughs> there's definitely a lot of that going back. And so there are a lot of really innocent ways to access your fantasies, to go back and look at like, okay, so I always thought this was cool or I always liked this superhero because of that costume or I always liked when this person got tied up on TV, you know? <laughs> um, but so that like fantasies come from, I think a good place and that you just don't have to fear them. Like, please don't fear them, please honor your fantasies and let them be what they are and get help if you need it. But don't feel like you need it just because you're having a fantasy that maybe society doesn't think is okay. I'll go next if I may. Um, so thank you for bringing up laws and politics because that's my bread and butter. I'm, I'm a lawyer. Um, there are laws going through Congress um, that are just horrific. Um, you know, anti-trans laws. Um, uh, there are laws that would censor even more sexual content on the internet. If you heard about Sester Foster, well, the new version of that is the Burn It Act. Um, it's cloaked in the language of child protection, but it's really nothing about child protection. Um, there are also laws that would ban sex dolls that look too childlike. Um, they're easy laws for politicians to support because it evokes an ew, yuck reaction, but will it save any real children from abuse? Absolutely not. Um, and unfortunately, these laws, there's one called the Creeper Act, another one called the Justice Act, these have got dozens of lawmakers signing on as co-sponsors. But guess what? There's another law called the Invest in Child Safety Act that would devote $5 billion to preventing uh, child sexual abuse and, um, and enforcement, which has three co-sponsors because it doesn't evoke that same horrified reaction. Um, so we could use all the help that we can get. Um, one of the other ways that you can help if you can't donate is to volunteer to spread the word. So please follow both of our organizations, Prostasia and Heal, Founder, Heal, Heal Project, um, to find out more about ways that you can get involved in our campaigning activities and really make a difference on the ground. Yeah, I would say, um, I, I would say like to thinking about parents, uh, um, 
think about how we stifle um, our young people's uh, fantasies and how that relates to our own fantasies or lack thereof or fear of them, right? Um, that the, the, the idea, this fundraiser we had was about, you know, fantasy is not abuse, but of course we talked about so much more, right? That it, it's a, a ripple effect into so many things. Um, it's not just about that, but it, it really it really kind of boils down to this um, this uh, place that we're getting to of um, like uh, what is it when we are uh, I always forget that word a red V are um, when we're being criminalized for our thoughts um, for our, um, thought, thought policing. policing thought policing yes for thought policing and that is that's like real that is so real that is like happening right now it scares the hell out of me um because this this under the guise of protection we keep this is such a lie anytime something is under the guise of protection i think it's a lie because everything is cloaked <laughs> under that so i'd say um really be careful in terms of like policy stuff but also really dig deep into to yourselves and like think about where um the ideas you've had about fantasies or taboos and how that's kind of um, coming out of you um, and uh, yeah how is it affecting you how are you navigating that um, yeah sit and think about that thank you so much ignacio yes i want to invite everyone to uh, we're going to have our fundraiser up for another week we hope to, we can make our goal of five thousand dollars in the next week so uh please uh you know if you have you know anyone who may be interested in it we will send out the recording and it would be available feel free to send it to uh friends uh anyone you know who you think can benefit from this content and let them know about this uh fundraiser about our organizations and all the ways that you can get involved we appreciate your time today uh, we hope you join us for future events because uh, as far as we're concerned this conversation has just gotten started there is so much more that to talk about so we hope that you uh, accompany us for future events as well thank you everyone thank you very much thank, thank you, you.